Hello and welcome to our second UN 2023 Water Conference talk show coming to you live from the SDG studio here at UN headquarters in New York. My name is Shakun Tilasantharan, Shaxx for short. In this second show, we will be focusing on the source to sea approach to managing land, freshwater, marine, and uh, coastal ecosystems. This approach has been uh, in focus uh, in preparations for this conference, and it's been gaining momentum since the 2022 UN Ocean Conference that was held in Lisbon, Portugal. And this is a, a holistic way of looking at uh, water systems as a continuum, linking causes and effects. It recognizes that what we do on land and and in rivers and lakes can have an impact downstream along our coasts and in the ocean. And it requires that we trace the impacts of problems back to the source and then focus actions and solutions there at the source. The approach is inherently uh, cross-sectoral. It requires cooperation between upstream and downstream actors and across sectors and administrative borders. As I said, it is a cross-sectoral approach, which is one of the leading principles of the UN 2023 Water Conference. We will be finding out a lot more about this approach with our expert guests who are here with me in the studio. We have with us Ruth Matthews, who is with the Stockholm Institute, uh, International Water Institute, SIWI for short, and then Dr. Mohammed Kausa Ahmed, who is with the government of the People's Republic of Bangladesh. And also with us is Boyan Slat, who is founder and CEO of the Ocean Cleanup. He joins us online from Rotterdam. First, let's get a taste of the atmosphere at the conference, here's our reporter, Haja Yakubi. Thank you, Shox. We're here in the entrance hallway of the United Nations. As you can see, a bustling hallway. Uh, and it's not surprising that it's such a bustling hallway because this is the first UN water conference in almost 50 years. So let's check out what people are here for, but most especially what they're expecting. Hello, who's here with me? Hi, this is Shomi. And Shomi, where are you from? I am from Bangladesh. I'm from Italy. Hello, my name is Pacha Kanchai, indigenous Yanacona from Colombia. It's in the lowlands of the Netherlands. New York. It's South African. What are your hopes for this conference? I am hoping to see some serious commitments for the Water Action Agenda. The important core message is that we must treat water and the water cycle as a global public good that needs all of our collective effort. What I really hope is that we uh, adopt the vision of a drinkable river as our compass for our daily actions and for our shared actions. So Elisa, I'm really curious to know what brings you here specifically to the UN Water Conference. So since I make part of a World Youth Organization pursuing an advisory opinion from International Court of Justice, we are really hoping that uh, what is going to happen to this conference will complement what we're pursuing, which is climate justice in general and intergenerational equity. It is beyond the dollars and cents, because without water you can't live. All our descendants, all the future generations they are coming, we need to bring to all of them a precious water, a good planet, and we are here speaking about that. So, loads of different people, very exciting to see. So I'd say, back to you, Shucks. Well, joining us now here in the studio, we have uh, Duat Cordero, who is Minister of Environment and Climate Action of Portugal. Thank you very much Thank for joining for us, Duat. So, if we could look back at uh, that UN Ocean Conference that was held in uh, Portugal and uh, co-hosted by Portugal and Kenya, that event set uh, important stepping stones for this 2023 uh, water conference. So what were the key messages, the most important outcomes from the Oceans Conference? Thank you very much for the invitation. The first and most important was Lisbon Declaration. Um, I think we have to assume that we are failing protecting uh, marine ecosystems, yet we need to do more. We need to scale up on the solutions, everything related with new solutions, science, uh, uh, that allow us to uh, have more instruments to uh, interact with the, the cleaning of the oceans, and also the nexus between 
SDG 6 and SDG 14. So if you take care of your rivers, you will take care of the sea. If you have a strategy for sanitation, if you have a strategy for having water with quality, you will have better coastal uh, quality on your waters. And my country is a good example. We're going <laughs> to ask you a bit more about uh, uh, what's happening in Portugal. So as you rightly pointed out, it's all connected, right? So fresh water and uh, the marine ecosystem. And one of the key moments at last year's uh, Ocean Conference was a high-level symposium that Portugal yeah organized right on this connection between SDG 6 clean water and sanitation for all by 2030 and SDG 14 which is life below water how is this UN conference making that bridge I think it's doing correctly I think we are now approaching it as an all as, a, as you said in an holistic view and it's the correct one um, I took back to my country uh, 30 years ago uh, on quality of water Portugal had more or less 50% of water with quality. Today we have almost 99%. We had 30 years ago almost 28% of people uh, with sanitation. Now we have 85. If you look to that and you look at all the diseases that were prevented, the problems that we started to eliminate, all the quality of the coastal uh, uh, water that we have. Today we have a, uh, an instrument that measures the quality of the beaches in Portugal. Uh, it's a blue flag. Last year we had a record of blue flags, which is because uh, they have water with quality. And they, they only have water with quality because we use it and we may return it to the sea treated. Uh, for, it's very important to understand that everything is connected. If we take care of the pollution in the rivers, we will take care of the pollution in the sea. If we, if we use it mod, in a moderate way, the water, and then you return it to the sea treated, of course you will have uh, less pollution in the sea, better ecosystems, better quality in your coastal uh, waters. So this is a path that needs to be uh, uh, studied, it needs to be profounded in terms of, of what are the policies that you can use. In our case, it was 30 years of policy. I know that it must be shared. You, must, you, have, you have now new technologies that help you uh, preventing uh, pollution on the sea through the rivers and you must use it. You must take all these opportunities to scale up the response. Can you give us a, a more specific example of how um, actions being taken on land to reduce uh, the impacts on the ocean and how that's then translating into uh, an upstream or uh, yeah, benefits back on land? So as a circular... So, uh, as I told you, if you have better sanitation, if you have uh, uh, what we call, now we, we use the expression even the, the, fa the factories of water, because even the term of reutilization of water is very important. But if you use it, of course you have new problems now regarding with the drought, the scarcity of the resource. But if you d return the water with quality to the sea, you will improve the entire ecosystem of the coast. Uh, you, of course, that are not the only problems that we face with water, and it's very important on, the, on this conference that we face the floods, we face the droughts, we understand the importance uh, of adaptation. But it's important to understand that there are two uh, issue, very important issues. Quality of water that is related with health, that is related with the good ecosystems on your marine coasts, and that for Portugal was, is very easy to understand. If you uh, look at the, the, the rate of the diseases related with water, and they dropped completely. Uh, Portugal have a good connection between the evolution that we have on the indicators of health, on the indication of the quality of, co of the coastal uh, waters, and the increase of sanitation, the increase of water treated with quality. That connection, I think, is not only from, from my country, it's all the countries that have made this evolution in the last 30 years. So that not all the countries have the same opportunities, not all the countries have the access to the same technology, the same instruments, and that's something that we need to share. So that is the next step, to cooperate at all the levels. Uh, and that's something that we need to do. We do it uh, because 
uh, we are also, uh, we need to do it because we have a lot of international rivers, so we cooperate with other countries like Spain, but you need also to cooperate sharing uh, with uh, the other countries what are the uh, new insights that you have, the new technology that you use, because they, things became cheaper, they can be shared, they can be used by other countries. We try to do that in our cooperation policy, but I think it must be done at a, a different level and with much more intensity from now on. Thank you for helping uh, illustrate how everything it's is connected. connected. Yeah, and that coordination and cooperation are vital to getting back on track and that water is key to achieving all of yeah. our sustainable development goals. So as the UN Secretary General Special Envoy for the Ocean, Ambassador Peter Thompson said, we cannot achieve SDG 14 without SDG, SDG 6. And we do need an integrated approach, which source to see is. Dot, thank you so very much. Thank you very much for, for your answer. insights. Thank you, thank you very much. Where I come from is a vulnerable country to bear the consequences of climate change. Lake Sevan is one of the world's largest high altitude freshwater lakes. But pollution and persistent droughts threaten the lake. My lake is ill. How to stop this? So now let us find out more about the uh, source to sea approach. And Ruth Matthews leads Seaweed's source to sea program. You are the perfect person to tell us more about this approach. Why is it important? What's really important about the source to sea approach is that it helps us understand that land, freshwater, coastal, and marine ecosystems are connected. And you would think that's obvious, but in reality, it isn't something that we have done in the past. We have had the tendency to work in our own silos, in our own areas of expertise, of what we're comfortable with, what we know. And because of that, what has happened is that we take a system that is one interconnected whole and splice it into bits and pieces. And when we do that and make decisions based on those individual splices of, of the whole system, we can end up making choices and investments and, and development that actually harms someplace else in the source to sea system. So what we see is that if we are going to accomplish SDC, SDG 6 and the sustainable development agenda overall, we really need to have this holistic view of the interconnection, both from upstream to downstream, but also then back upstream. So just uh, expand on that. How could this get us back on track with SDG 6 and the other water-related uh, SDGs? The key that I see in this is that with SDG 6, with water, we, we always say this, water is life. It flows through everything that we do. And that means that it can't be its own individual independent goal. It's really a goal that spreads across the entire sustainable development agenda. And so when we are thinking about achieving SDG 6, we really need to be thinking about these interconnections. And you mentioned this cross-sectoral nature of the discussions here at, uh, at the UN. Uh, and, and that's very critical because what has happened in the past is that uh, the governance that uh, um, that, that we use to manage water, uh, the, um, the finance that we use to put investment into the developments of water, uh, the science that we do has all been fragmented. So you might have uh, those bits that are about the parts of the land or parts of the water, parts of the coastal area in the ocean, uh, but they're not talking to each other and they're not working together. And, and that leads us to miss opportunities where we could really create benefits that will 
be optimal for the entire source disease system and draw from those benefits that allow us to in make investments with more confidence that they will have a positive impact. Thank you, Ruth. Now, uh, Kausa, you are Secretary at uh, the Ministry of Planning for the government of Bangladesh now. Your country, Bangladesh, is one of the first governments, I understand, uh, to actively apply the source to see approach to governance, uh, and, and you're one of the leading experts on this topic. How is Bangladesh using the approach? Oh, I mean, uh, as Ruth rightly pointed out, that uh, in the past we used to think uh, the glaciers, the headwaters, I mean the upstream, downstream, estuary, coast, and, and, and ocean, deep ocean, where, I mean, I, I, I mean, I mean we, used to, we used to think uh, uh, in silos, I mean, I mean, but now we understand that they are, I mean, right from the glaciers up to the deep ocean, they are inseparably interconnected and interlinked. So if we want to do something in the coast, in the estuary, in, in, in the ocean, then we have to understand the whole, I mean, I mean, the system right from the source to the sea. So, I mean, back in Bangladesh, our government is, as you may know that, uh, I mean, we have uh, a Delta plan, which is 80 years, uh, I mean, uh, uh, which span uh, about 80 years. So it's a long-term plan, kind of a strategic plan. And uh, th that plan is to tackle the climate change. And now, I mean, re very recently, we devised our plan, the strategic plan, and we incorporated source to sea approach into that plan. Please tell us more about uh, Bangladesh's Delta plan. Okay, yeah. So Bangladesh Delta plan is, as, as I told you, is a long-term, I mean, I mean, plan. It's a kind of overarching plan, strategic plan. So it, it deals with economics, it deals with environmental sustainability, it deals with social sustainability. So these three sustainability is, is the key factor and, and is the key pillar of uh, uh, Delta Plan. So Delta Plan is, uh, I mean, um, initially uh, formulated and developed with the Dutch government, uh, and uh, uh, the Dutch government helped us a lot. Uh, so uh, uh, at this moment, we are, I mean, uh, moving uh, with the Delta Plan. I mean, as far as our Vision 2041 is concerned, and that's, uh, I mean, by the year, 2041, Bangladesh would be a developed country, and uh, we are uh, eyeing on uh, you know uh, one trillion dollar uh, GDP uh, uh, growth. Uh, that's what you know. I mean, the, the vision of our uh, honourable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. Bangladesh has several industries like uh, garment uh, making, textiles, agriculture, and those could have a, a downstream impact on your uh, coasts and oceans. How can the source to sea approach be used to address that? Uh, as you may know that Bangladesh is lower riparian country. So, you know, upper riparian countries are India, Nepal, Bhutan, China, Tibet. I mean, uh, if, you, uh, if you separate uh, Tibet from China, otherwise China stand alone. So, uh, I mean, uh, the, 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 as you may know that uh, Bangladesh is Deltaic country. I mean, it's uh, 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 we call Gangetic Delta. There are three big mighty rivers, Ganges, Brahmaputra, and Meghna. So uh, uh, we call collectively Ganges, Meghna, Brahmaputra river system. It carries, you know, huge amount of uh, sediment, huge amount of water yearly. So. The, the, the catchment area uh, uh, is only 7%. So, you know, the, the water, I mean, I mean uh, transports through these three rivers are essentially 92% water are from upstream. I mean, ch India, China, Nepal, and Bhutan. So, you know, I mean, I mean as, you, as we all know that uh, it's easy solution to dump something into the water. Since, I mean, uh, uh, in the past we used to say that uh, 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 solution is the uh, 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 
dilution is the solution of pollution. So, you know, <laughs> anything can be diluted is easily be, you know, uh, 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 get rid of the pollution. So, uh, but the thing is, uh, you know, since Bangladesh is a lower riparian country, I mean, it receives water from upstream. So anything, I mean, uh, uh, anything dumped, anything, I mean, the, 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 the I mean, the industrial effluent are being dumped in India, Nepal, Bhutan, and China is, is coming through uh, the, the water. So it's not that uh, Bangladesh is a hugely developed country. We have many industries, and we are, you know, uh, uh, putting all the effluents uh, without treating uh, uh, directly into the water. It's, it's not that. So, uh, I mean, we are getting polluted water uh, uh, as well from the upstream. So uh, 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 it's, it's, uh, to get rid of that, we need transboundary uh, kind of uh, mechanism, transboundary negotiation. Uh, at this moment, we have a good uh, transboundary negotiation with uh, Nepal and India, but uh, we need to uh, 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 do a little bit more. We need to put pressure on uh, the uh, upper riparian country as far as the you know, dumping of uh, uh, industrial effluent directly into uh, the water without any treatment is concerned. So, um, yes. Thank you for illustrating that. Uh, yes, because we've got all these waterways that uh, aren't located in just one country, uh, shared borders, right, on uh, 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 rivers uh, as well as uh, underground uh, water or groundwater, as you call it. Now, our next guest uh, is Boyan Slat, and he is a Dutch inventor and entrepreneur who's passionate about creating mega projects to address our planet's problems. He is the founder and CEO of the Ocean Cleanup, which is working to rid the world's oceans of plastic. We have a video, Boyan, uh, of your work. Let's check it out first. So at the Ocean Cleanup, our mission is to rid the world's oceans of plastic. The real complicated part of this puzzle is that everything is interlinked. What we need to do is two things. One, we need to clean up the legacy pollution. Two, we need to close the tap. So, Boyan, you were talking about closing the tap uh, in that video. You have been um, clean, well, Ocean Cleanup has officially removed, uh, I understand, some 100,000 kilograms of plastic so far from the Great uh, Pacific Garbage Patch, but there are millions and millions and millions of tons more. You are continuing with the work in the oceans, but you're also now shifting your focus to the rivers. Yeah, that's right. So at the Ocean Cleanup, our mission is to rid the world's oceans of plastic. and. Uh, so to solve this problem, we believe there's we need a two-pronged approach. Where on one hand there is yeah there's the, the, the legacy pollution. Uh, in fact, we've now we're very close to removing having removed 200,000 kilos uh, of plastic from this Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Uh, but at the same time, there's still a lot of plastic flowing into the ocean, and if we don't deal with that then of course we would have to be cleaning forever, and that's not what we want to do. We want to help ourselves out of business as soon as possible. So uh, what we have devised for that is that what we found is that rivers really are the, the arteries that carry the trash from land to sea. Um, about 95% of all the plastic that's in the ocean comes from uh, rivers. And of that, what we found is that just 1% of the world's rivers is responsible for roughly 80% of all the, the global uh, plastic emissions. So, you know, it's still a thousand rivers, right? so it's still really a, a, a global problem. But at least it means that 99% of the rivers we don't have to uh, worry about. And then what we, what we have discovered is that it's really um, you know, the, the coastal cities or rivers and streams and drains running through these coastal cities in you know, sort of densely urbanized areas in middle-income countries, which are the, um, the hotspots for plastic pollution. Uh, right now, we have these interceptors, which are these devices to catch this plastic uh, in uh, 10 rivers around the world. 
but ultimately, we um, you know, we aim to to scale you know, to 20 rivers by the end of the year, and ultimately uh, in the next decade to about a thousand. I guess it's too soon to tell if there's a, an impact yet on what's happening in the oceans, right? Now that you're focusing on the rivers as well. Yeah, so I think with rivers, what's an interesting angle to that is that, yes, there's the global impact. Of course, it has impact on the, the total amount of plastic in the ocean, but you also have this very direct and visible impact on the location where you are deployed. Um, so, for example, here we see Jamaica. Uh, actually, just a few days ago, they had very heavy rains. Uh, there were you know, you know, really tens of tons of uh, plastic flowing through these little gullies in Kingston uh, to the Caribbean Sea. Uh, but now we have these interceptors there. You know, that trash actually didn't reach the oceans. And we, we would know that if these interceptors wouldn't be there, then you know, this entire coastal area around, you know, in and around Kingston would be heavily polluted following these rains. So, um, so yeah, of course, it takes, takes years to ultimately tackle, you know, to, to see the difference at a global scale, but on a local scale, you see the difference immediately, which is tremendously valuable for um, you know, different industries when you think of fisheries, as well as the tourism industries on, you know, near these places where we are active. Was there one specific thing that uh, caused you to change your approach to be focusing more on the rivers now? Um, look, I think really from the beginning, it was clear that we had to do both. I think you know, one thing that we learned that sort of strengthened our belief that uh, this is you know, a sensible place to, to focus on is that you know, what we found is that really just a quarter of a percent of all the plastic that's being produced, we see ending up in the ocean. So right now there's 400 million tons of plastic that's being produced every year. But in terms of what we see going into the ocean, it's, it's about a million tons, which of course is still a tremendously huge amount. Uh, but on the other hand, it's just a quarter of a percent. Right? So, um, so what we believe is that by addressing these rivers, you know, that's going to be you know, simply the fastest and most cost-effective way. It's not uh, a replacement to getting good waste infrastructure uh, to even make sure that the waste doesn't even end up in the river in the first place. Um, but yeah, it, you know, it, that of course takes time, takes a lot of money to get the waste infrastructure to where it needs to be. So intercepting a rivers um, you know, with this, this knowledge, we believe is, you know, is really the right way to, to stop plastic pollution today. Ruth, what do you think of Boyan's uh, plans, or what they're doing, rather, and, and Bangladesh's plans? Well, one of the things that, that we've been thinking about when we look at the, the issue of, of marine pol pollution is we, we've actually created a source to see framework for that. And, and it, it, it includes two things. One is, uh, obviously, we do want to move towards a more circular economy. Uh, as Boyan said, we, the, the, the first goal should be that we don't have that kind of waste. And so we don't have uh, the problems of having to manage the volumes of waste that we are having to manage now. Uh, and then secondarily, we need to uh, be able to keep that resource in, in the economy. So we can move from this, you know, take, use, deposit type of approach to, uh, to something where it remains a resource throughout. So that's one aspect of, of it. The, the other aspect is that we do want to work at the source of the problem. And, and so we do want to work on, on that aspect of strengthening the capacity for uh, appropriate solid waste management. And one of the projects that I have been fortunate to be able to do is uh, in central Vietnam, uh, working on this issue. And uh, we were able to work with uh, a, a set of stakeholders, bring them together, uh, learn how they are interacting with waste uh, in their various roles, and work with them to come up with an understanding of their relationships with each other. 
So, so what does that mean? What that means is that we brought together the, the waste managers from the utility. We brought together the Department of Natural Resources and Environment and other, uh, other agencies that interact with waste management and the environment. Uh, and, and then we also brought in uh, the tourism sector and the informal sector because in developing countries, the informal sector can play an, an immense role in the solid waste management. And so we brought them all together so that they could talk with each other about the problem of plastic pollution and think together about their own individual roles and responsibilities, their interdependencies with each other. Uh, so what do they need from other uh, stakeholders in, in the waste stream system to be able to be successful in their role uh, and, and then had them in a very cross-sectoral way come up with actions that they could each take to contribute to reducing plastic pollution. And so it becomes a, a shared collaborative approach to addressing a problem that they all care about that none of them can solve independently. They need to have it as a collective action. And, and by using this approach that we have developed, that builds that community of action that can then address the problem at the source. That sounds well, very effective to me, bringing everybody together and getting them to recognize their various roles and, and to be able to communicate mm. with each other what they need to. Have, have there been any results from this effort? Well, it was really exciting to, to actually do this because it, it was probably one of the first times that the informal sector was sitting down with the government uh, in the same conversation. And they were just so thrilled to be able to be part of that process and to be recognized for the contribution that, that they give to the whole system. And so there were commitments made by the people, the chair of the uh, People's Committee and the Department of Natural Resources and Environment the, of responding to some of the needs that they expressed that they had to be able to be more successful. And so it started that dialogue and created a relationship that hadn't been there before so that then that can play out over time. Boyan, what do you think of what uh, Ruth was talking about, what Siri's doing? And, and are you working with different players in your work? Oh yeah, I mean, so I mean, I couldn't agree more with with what was uh, what was said. I mean, ultimately, these are very complex uh, circumstances. You deal with very you know, many different stakeholders, um, and I think an important point to stress is that I think when it comes to you know, river interception versus you know, further upstream uh, initiatives. You know, there's no either or there. I think, um, in fact, these things strengthen each other um, because you know, what we have seen in practice now is that, for example, in the case of the Dominican Republic, where uh, we deployed one of our first interceptors to go, um, that the, the presence of an interceptor, uh, interceptor and the attention that it draws uh, acts like a catalyst for, for further upstream change. So uh, in, in this particular instance, we've been fortunate to work together with the UNDP. And what they want to, to do is to, to build on, on the back of this project uh, on legislation, on where the communities living alongside the river to improve their waste management. And having the interceptor there, you actually have a very effective uh, monitor monitoring tool uh, to to see whether these things actually have an effect, right? Because uh, you can you capture what flows by, what would have entered into the ocean. Of course, the primary purpose is to stop the leakage, uh, but then as a secondary goal, yeah, these are really you know, unique uh, monitoring platforms to to then inform those working on those further upstream changes. Kausa, your reflections on what's been shared so far, yes. is there anything yes. here for, uh, that could help the Bangladeshi government's efforts? Yeah, many of us 
perhaps don't know that Bangladesh was the first country to ban plastic bags in, back in 2002. So, you know, I mean, uh, I mean uh, we've been, uh, um, I mean, though Bangladesh is a very poor country, I mean, least developed countries, now, you know, I mean, uh, uh, we are trying to be, you know, upper middle income countries. Uh, but uh, uh, we used to think about the environment very carefully from the very beginning of our, you know, industrial uh, revolution or industrial, you know, generation, industrial development. So, but, but the thing is, you know, I mean, it's very hard to get rid of the plastic because plastic is very easy, easy to produce and very easy to use. So, I mean, we have to have at least an alternative of plastic, first of all. And then, you know, we have to, we have to rethink. We have three hours. We can reuse, we can, you know, uh, 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 recycle. But, you know, we have to rethink and redesign because we have to change our behavior. Otherwise, if we, if we you know, uh, uh, don't change our behavior, it would be rather difficult to get rid of the plastic pollution in, 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 in land, in, uh, in the water, or in the, in the ocean. As we all know that by the year 2050, uh, the plastic would be more than the fish living in, in, the, uh, in, 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 in the ocean. So you know, it's, it's really alarming. So, uh, first of all, we have to, uh, we have, to have a, an alternative, a very good alternative of, you know, uh, plastic. And uh, we have to go for, you know, very strict regulation for single-use plastics. And these macroplastic, you know, tend to generate microplastic as well. So, you know, this, this macroplastic is not that... I mean, it creates a, 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 a nuisance in, in the water, but it, it generates a, a microplastic, which is really very dangerous for the oceanic health. I mean, the, 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 especially the fish live in the water and other aquatic animals. Our health too, because yes. they're finding microplastics in our drinking water now, right? Um, so, Ruth, what would you say to anyone who's watching, listening, who's still not convinced that source to sea is the way to go? So I guess what I would say is uh, when we think about the, um, yeah, from source to sea, it can be difficult to, uh, to let's say, motivate the upstream to act for the downstream. It kind of sounds like you're looking upstream saying it's all your fault, you, you need to change and, and you need to make it so that downstream it's okay. And I'm saying it in a not so nice way, but, but just to say that, that there is that uh, perspective of uh, why, what's in it for me, let's say, to take action. Is it only a benefit for the downstream party? That's what we need to understand is that the benefits from a healthy downstream move back upstream. And I think that's going to really make the difference if people can understand, say for instance, if we continue to uh, pollute the ocean to the level that we have been, that contributes to uh, how climate change is going to develop over time. If we clean up the waters going into the ocean, not just from plastic, but all different kinds of chemical and nutrient pollutions, we clean up the coastal areas, that retains the capacity of the ocean to mitigate uh, for climate change, mitigate the carbon and greenhouse gases, and also to help us to adapt because a healthy coastal area is the strongest defense to storm uh, storm activity. So all of that, if that starts happening, we act upstream to protect the downstream, this actually comes back to us as a benefit. So I think what we need to recognize is that this is not a one-way street. Uh, you upstream need to do something good for us downstream. It's really, it really is a circular reality that we 
live with. And anything that we do to improve the health of our deltas, coasts, and ocean uh, gives us a stronger base for sustainable development throughout the source to sea system. Boyan, your thoughts? What commitments are you hoping to see uh, from this water conference? Yeah, I think it's. It's great to to recognize this source to sea principle, right? I think it's um, as as said, you know, plastic pollution starts on land, and um, I think if commitments could be made to to really reduce the amount of uh, emissions that are coming from land to the oceans, I think that could you know, greatly incentivize the the adaption. Of, of solutions throughout the chain from you know, on land to the river mouth to the sea, uh, which is ultimately needed to, to solve this, this problem. Um, we'd be very fortunate to, to work together with pioneering governments in you know, Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam, uh, Dominican Republic, uh, Guatemala, Jamaica, US, um, who now have adopted these interceptors. But I think once, um, once it's internationally recognized uh, and even mandated that uh, these emissions must reduce, um, you know, then hopefully that will greatly accelerate the uh, the global adoption of solutions to to stop plastic emissions before the plastic becomes ocean plastic. Okay, we are hearing here in this conversation, and also with our guests before we need better governance more finance in water-related investments that is very fragmented now. We need more people talking and working together. So how optimistic are you, Kausa, first, that this is going to uh, happen in, at, well, how much is that going to happen at this conference and in the near future? Uh, it's, 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 it's pretty difficult because, you know, as Ruth Wright pointed out that, you know, I mean, the, the, the upper European country tends to think that it's, it's not our problem, you know, just dump something, dump into the water and, uh, you know, the, get rid of the problem. So it's, 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 it's the problem of the, the, the na our neighbors who lives in uh, downstream. It, it, uh, and, and I would like to stress uh, on, uh, on the point that cleanup is not the solution. I mean, we have to, we have to think holistically uh, I mean, comprehensively. I mean, uh, the, the source to sea is, in my, in my opinion, is a kind of paradigm shift as far as the water management is concerned. So, I mean, integrated water resource management is also uh, a, a, not a problem, but source to sea is a problem. But the thing is, I mean, I mean who is going to build the cat? I mean, how to move with the finance, how to move with the technology, how to move with the you know, uh, 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 right framework, and how to move with the transboundary you know, uh, 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 kind of uh, transboundary politics or transboundary river management, water management, and uh, 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 between the you know, uh, a good behavior and good gesture and good diplomatic relation between the uh, upper riparian country and lower riparian countries. So uh, it's, 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 it's pretty difficult, but not uh, impossible. Well, the world needs to come together or yeah. the consequences are dire, um, yeah. as we can see with what's happening in the oceans already uh, that Bowen is mo all too familiar with, right? Ruth, uh, before we uh, wrap up here, what are your thoughts? Are you optimistic mm -hmm. about possibilities moving forward? I'm unfortunately a, an eternal optimist, so yes, I am, I am optimistic. Uh, it, but I think the reason I'm optimistic about this is because when people hear it, and it even happened with you, uh, when you were first talking to me, you said, well, source to see, it's just, it's logical. And I think that's the real value of what we've been able to bring forward with with talking about the, the continuum from land to freshwater to the coast and the marine environment and calling that source to sea is that there's just kind of this aha moment of, yeah, right, they are connected. And I think that gives people the, the, the spirit to, to, sh to make that shift 
towards a more holistic approach. Uh, and, and it helps bring that courage to reach across to the different sectors, to the different parties upstream and downstream, and, and to think about how, how can we face this problem, these challenges that are source to see challenges. They do cross these boundaries. We, we cannot solve them independently. And, and so then we really need to come together and hold hands to solve them. And so I think the, the source to see uh, terminology and reality really inspires that action. Thank you all very much indeed. Uh, we're going to listen to this inspiring message from uh, Seawee's Stockholm Junior Water Prize laureate, Annabelle uh, Rayson. She has this message for us. Hello, my name is Annabelle Rayson, and I'm the winner of the 2022 Stockholm Junior Water Prize, where I represented Canada with my project, Plankton Wars, an innovative analysis of Daphne adenotype biomanipulation for algae bloom prevention. I live in southwestern Ontario, and I am surrounded by the beautiful North American Great Lakes, which combined contain one-fifth of the world's fresh surface water, provide drinking water to over 80% of Ontarians, and provide vast economic and employment opportunity. Growing up in this region, I have a deep appreciation for the environment and freshwater ecosystems. However, freshwater ecosystems around the world and in my region are at risk due to harmful algae blooms. Algae blooms are large groups of algae that negatively impact water quality and ecosystem diversity, cause dead zones and fish kills, release dangerous toxins, and cost the fishing and tourism industries millions of dollars. Harmful algae blooms are exasperated by excessive nutrient pollution from land and climate change. Essentially, they contain toxins that are harmful to humans, plants, and animals, and the water is not safe to drink or swim in. Additionally, the fish exposed to these toxins are unsafe for consumption. These factors result in incredible losses to the fishing and tourism industries, the recreational opportunities of fresh water, and aquatic biodiversity. Personally, my father is a commercial fisherman, and due to harmful algae blooms, he is no longer able to fish in certain areas. For my research, I have learned that biomanipulation is when an ecosystem is manipulated to create a desired effect. Daphne and Magna are a keystone filter feeding zooplankton species in freshwater ecosystems that I have discovered to be the best species of freshwater zooplankton to biomanipulate to treat and prevent harmful algae blooms. However, very little is known about the species' distinct genotypes, which could allow for more effective and sustainable biomanipulation of the species for algae bloom treatment and prevention. In my experiment, I compared the abilities of four genetically distinct genotypes of Daphne and Magna to consume algae to see which one would be better to biomanipulate to protect freshwater ecosystems from harmful algae blooms, and then tested the most effective genotype in different environmental conditions to discover its success in the ever-changing Great Lakes. In my conclusions, I discovered that genotype 4 is the ideal genotype of Daphne and Magna to biomanipulate to treat and prevent harmful algae blooms. I also discovered that this solution is still successful when exposed to microplastic and nutrient pollution from land, and its biomanipulative success can be improved through exposure to calcium carbonate and naturally occurring aquatic microbes. I believe that it is essential for everyone to have access to clean water. Whether they are from a large city, a small rural community, or indigenous land, it is our job as a society to do everything we can to ensure that this basic human right is clean, accessible water for all. We also need to ensure that our actions on land sustain and protect our water's quality and health. To do this, governments, corporations, and universities need to not only invest in aquatic research, but also implement the solutions that have been discovered to help solve water injustices. Additionally, the research needs to focus on natural science and sustainable solutions. By using nature to help protect, conserve, and improve nature, we can effectively limit risk and harm to aquatic ecosystems and create a more sustainable planet for all. Right, so uh, thank you very much once again to all our guests. We've been hearing from all the guests we've had so far. We need uh, better representation of different groups at the table, better governance, finance, not just top-down governance. Everybody needs to be working Together, cooperation, coordination keeps coming up, and everybody wants to see action at this conference. Uh, you've been talking about the, the importance of addressing what's happening at the source and not just addressing the problem after the fact, and that we need to motivate parties upstream when we're talking about the source to see approach so that they also see that it's not only for the benefit of uh, parties downstream, but that these benefits travel back upstream and that everybody as a whole benefits. And it's not, as you said, Ruth, 
a one-way street. Thank you all very much again, Ruth Kausa Boyan, for your time, for your insights. Uh, and uh, thank you to our audience for joining us. We hope that this has been informative and engaging. I will be back uh, at uh, 4.45 p.m. New York time with a spotlight segment on Indonesia. We hope you'll join us then. For now, from me and the team, goodbye for now.